We have something special for you tonight. We've got a guest speaker that is here tonight, but he's not really any guest. But let's welcome Josh Cotts tonight as he comes and minister the word of the Lord. Jeremy, was that you whistling at me? <laughs> um, well, I was just thinking about something, and before I get started, I wanted to say that I am blessed to be under the leadership of these two pastors, and blessed by them as a spiritual father and a mother, <laughs> and I don't think I tell them enough, and I, I actually just wanted to give them a second and, and honor them if we could do that as a church, I would like that. <laughs> it was, it was. <clears throat> Blessed to have my real parents and grandparents back there also. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I feel like tonight I have a word specific to our church, but I also think that it's kind of a general word, but I want to, if you are, if this is your home church, I want you to receive it as a word for us, and uh, if you're not, you can use it, it's a, it is also a general word, but I'm going to pray before I get started. So Father God, I thank you for everything you've done here tonight, I thank you for your presence being here, and the opportunity even to be able to come into that presence. So Lord, I ask that you would be with us tonight, God, and begin to open our ears and our eyes to see and hear the things that you want to say and show us tonight. Lord, in anything that I say, God, let it be your words that I speak tonight. And as those words pass through the filter of our ears, God, let them pass through the filter of your voice. And anything that passes through the filter of your voice, God, let my own words that are of my flesh that are not your words go on as void, and let your words take a passionate effect on our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. It's a story that we all know, and my own opinion, if you look at this story and study this specific story, you can basically get an idea for what the enemy plans to do anytime he's planning to do anything. It's like the foundation for what he wants to do pretty much any time. Let's start with verse 1 in chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And we'll stop there for right now. So this is a story of Adam and Eve and the fall of man. And the reason I feel like you can basically go back to this specific story and relate it to pretty much anything the devil does is because this is the very first thing that he did to man. Okay, And from there, he realized this plan works, so I'm going to stick with it. If this plan started it all, then this plan can actually work through it all. And anytime I go at anybody, I'm going to start here, and it might end up somewhere else, but if I start here, I'm going to be successful. So that's why I feel that way. I think that's what he was thinking whenever he, after this happened. So now, 
I don't know how long I'm going to talk tonight, but because this could be pretty short and it could be pretty long, depending on <laughs> depending on what God does while we're talking. So I'm going to go back through, and I'm going to go through each verse, and we're going to go verse by verse and kind of talk a little bit about each one. So verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Okay. What the enemy is doing right here with Adam and Eve is he is, first of all, blatantly going against the authority of God by questioning his command. Second of all, he's poking a little bit at Eve to try and get her to question God and his authority. He's poking at her a little bit. So I can imagine him saying, did God really say that? Did he really say you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say that? And whenever somebody says something like that to you, after you've been told something by someone else, I don't know about you, but you're like, maybe maybe they didn't say that. You ever been in that position before? <clears throat> somebody tells you they love you, and then somebody else says, do you think they really love you? Did they really say that they loved you? And you go, maybe they don't love me. So that's what he's doing. He's poking at Eve. He's trying to get her to that position. The second verse the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fr fruit from the trees in the garden. Directly quoting God. Okay, I don't know how much time was in between the enemy saying that to her and when she responded with that command that God gave them. But, I mean, the word does say that God literally commanded them to eat from every other tree except for the one in the middle. So she comes back with God's very words. So that's a smart thing to do. Then she does something pretty stupid also. She starts having a conversation with the devil. And that's also what the enemy wants to do. He wants to poke at you until you start talking to him. And if he can get in a conversation with you, then he's got some advantage there. Because he, he is crafty. And he, is, he does have a certain amount of power over us as human beings. Not over God. But he, he can fight us. The human part of us. So... The stupid thing she did was have a conversation with the devil. The smart thing she did was go back and say God's words right back to the enemy, which Jesus does when he's in the wilderness. After he'd been fasting, he comes back with the word of God, which is good, but he left it at that. Eve keeps going in the third verse. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. <clears throat> Halfway smart and halfway stupid again. Okay? Maybe two-thirds stupid. <laughs> okay, the smart part is that she continues with what God said. Another third of it is that she adds to God's word. God never said, don't touch it. And she told the enemy that God said, don't touch it. That was her, that was her own part. Okay, when I was praying tonight, asking God to not allow my words to, have any, to bear any fruit, that's what happened right there. That was a part of her coming out. That was the second third. The third third is she's still having a conversation with the devil. <laughs> okay, then verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Okay, so he's coming back now, again, going completely and blatantly against God's authority. Saying, God, what God told you is not right. Okay, the thing that God said to you, that if you ate from this tree, that's not true. You know, so don't believe it. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is the kicker. Okay, this specific verse right here. Saying you're not going to die. God knows the reason that you're going to eat, you can't eat from that is because God knows that your eyes are going to be opened and you'll be like Him. Basically saying, God doesn't want you to be like him. Okay? He knows that, and that's why he doesn't want you to eat from it. Not because you're going to die, but because he doesn't want you to be like him. And the reason I say that's the kicker is because what he started introducing right there to Eve was a spirit of insecurity. 
There's a cricket on the floor. <laughs> what he started introducing right there to Eve was a spirit of insecurity. Started making her insecure in God's word. Okay? Started making her feel like God didn't wasn't completely honest with, with them about what the tree was going to do. And introduces insecurity and introduces doubt right there in God. Introduces doubt in his character. Introduces doubt in his authority. Introduces doubt in their relationship. Okay, if somebody told you that some that the person you're in a relationship with, where it's a friend or wife or anything, if somebody told you that they told you something that wasn't completely true, doubt can enter into that relationship and can be extremely destructive if you allow it to. If you if you start trusting the other person, the other voice, rather than the voice of the person that you have a relationship with, that relationship can be destroyed. Okay? So he's making Adam and Eve, Eve specifically he's talking to right here, not trust God, which is especially hard for a woman. Okay? Especially hard for a woman who women were built to have trust in men. I believe that. They were built to depend on men. So specifically to Eve, probably the more apt to believe him at this point because she's a woman she starts doubting God's word starts doubting his heart for her and in that it can spread to Adam also but there was a reason I feel like the enemy was specifically targeting Eve with that statement in verse 6 it says then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So she believes the devil. She believes the enemy over God because she's become insecure and started doubting God's word, started doubting his heart, and chooses to hand her heart over to the enemy then and let him have influence over her. She gives in to temptation. That's what temptation is. It's anything that's good and pleasing to the eye <laughs> this eye that's temptation right there so she eats it in verse 7 it says then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves okay part i want to look at specifically is when it says they realized they were naked okay i believe their eyes were already open to begin with. When their physical eyes became opened, in a sense, they realized they were naked. That, to me, says that the enemy's original plan was to get their eyes off of God and onto themselves. Okay? Once they started looking at themselves, they lost their security in God. Once they started looking at themselves, they lost their faith in God. And they began doubting him because they were staring at an imperfect vessel. Their eyes used to be fixed on God, the perfect vessel, the perfect one, and now their eyes are fixed on imperfection. And that is an even bigger reinforcement in the enemy's previous, what he was trying to get to them in the first place. Okay, that's a reinforcement to his plan because he's trying to get them to doubt God's perfection. Okay? He's trying to get them to doubt God's perfection, His perfectness. <laughs> and when they did that, they began looking at themselves. They saw only imperfection. Okay? Now verse 8. I didn't read this earlier because this is my favorite part. Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They heard the sound of God, and they hid when they heard the sound of God because they doubted Him and they were insecure about themselves. They heard the sound of God and they hid because their eyes were fixed on themselves and not on God anymore. The sound of God 
in just about all throughout Scripture, sound always precedes a movement of God. Sound always precedes God's presence coming. Okay? When they heard the sound of God, because of their doubt in God, they hid rather than running to the move of God. They hid rather than running to the presence of God. Okay? And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get caught up in so much doubt and get my eyes off of God and onto myself so much that I hide whenever I hear the sound of God. I don't want to hide from the sound of God. If the sound of God means that God is moving, I don't want to hide from that. I want to run to it. So God wants to get your eyes off of Him and get them onto yourself and your own ability and your own strength and your own power, which is imperfect, so that whenever you hear the sound of God, you'll hide from it rather than running to it. And any time the Holy Spirit wants to move and do anything, you're going to be hiding because you've taken your eyes off of the perfect one. You've taken your eyes off of the one that cannot fall. You've taken your eyes off the one who cannot mess up or make mistakes. And you doubt His authority and you doubt His power. So whenever you hear the sound that's preceding the move of God, you hide. You do not participate in it. And pretty soon, you're in your own move, which is actually no movement at all. Because you cannot do anything by your own authority. You cannot do anything by your own power because you have none without God. You have no strength without God. The Word clearly says that. Anything of man fails without God. So the enemy's plan is not to get you to worship him so much as it is to get you not worshiping God. He doesn't want you to look at him as much as he wants you to look at yourself. Because you don't have power without God. You don't have strength without God. And if he can make you see that, then he's already won. The enemy knows that God Himself cannot be beaten. He cannot be, beat God Himself alone. God has already defeated Him. Okay? The enemy knows that you, when your eyes are fixed on God, cannot be beaten because you're under His authority and power. The enemy also knows that if he can make you doubt God, then he wins. Because that's exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. He made them doubt God's word. He made them doubt God's heart. And when they did, he won. That's all he had to do. And when God gives you something specific to do, when God gives you a word, when God gives you a command, and you don't stick to it because what you've done is you've sat there and analyzed yourself and how you can't do anything and you can't, you're not successful or you can't get people to come to church or you can't get people saved at your job or anything like that. When you get your eyes on that specific thing, you, the enemy wins wherever you go. The enemy has victory there. If God is powerless in your eyes, He's powerless in your life. If you see God as having no strength, as if you see God as having no character or power, then He's going to have that in your life. That's what's going to happen in your life. Because God's ability in our life to do anything, to affect our life in any way, is only to the measure that we allow Him to affect our life because of our free will. That doesn't mean we have power over God in any way. He can cross it any time He wants. But He loves us, so He gave us that choice because He loves us. So if the enemy can convince us that God has no power or authority in the way of making us look at ourselves in the mirror all the time, and that's all we see, then we don't see any power. We have no dependence on God then because we don't have any power without God. And then the enemy wins in whatever situation it is. I'm going to reiterate that over and over. Because I think, I don't know about you guys, but I think that doubt has been a serious problem in our body. Doubt for what is ahead. Doubt for a vision for the future Okay, we've had so much, so many things happen here 
that we've, we've allowed doubt to kind of intercept us a little bit and slow us down, and it's ruined vision, so we have no place to go to. We have no place to move to. I really think that that's been a serious thing because we have spent too much time looking at our own ability and our own strength to get through these things. And I'm not saying all of us, but we're together in this. you know. So if some of us are, then all of us are. But we've spent way too much time not having our eyes on God and not having our eyes on the, the power and authority, the only power and authority there is. The greatest power and authority there is. I had a dream the other night and uh, I had my Bible open. I was just standing in some room somewhere and I was about to read a scripture and it was a scripture that I had not memorized in real life. But in my dream, for some reason I knew that it's what I needed to read. Is my spirit. And I opened it up and I was about to read and I said, Let's turn to Acts 2.34, a scripture that I had not memorized before, and it's actually in that specific verse, it's actually reiterated five times throughout the Bible. But as soon as I was about to read it, a spirit jumped on me, and I I jolted awake. I woke up. And so I, in the middle of the night, grabbed my Bible and looked up that scripture, and you know what it says? It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And at first I didn't know exactly how that pertained to anything that was going on, but I know now that it pertains to exactly what I wanted to say tonight. First of all saying, that's God the Father talking to God the Son when it says, the Lord said to my Lord... That's the Father talking to the Son. Whenever Jesus ascended, He was given power and authority over everything. And in Ephesians, it says that everything was placed below His feet. In that specific verse, it says that His enemies were made a footstool for His feet. And the feet are part of the body. So everything was placed beneath the body that allows Christ to be the head. Everything. There was given authority to Christ's body, the, the body that allows Christ to be the head. Everything was placed beneath that body. They were given authority over the enemy through Christ. And in that there cannot be doubt because in that there is no authority. When there is doubt, that relinquishes the authority that we have in Christ. And that doesn't mean that we stand up against the enemy all the time with our sword and we beat him back like he's a like he is a bad guy. But we don't beat him back like he's the one we're trying to get to all the time. We're punching him around and we have to beat him up because he's ruining our lives and he's getting in our faces and everything. Okay, that's not the answer. (laughs) It's through Christ. It's through Christ. And the word even says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because without Christ, I have no strength at all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have authority through Christ. But it's only through Christ. It's only through Christ. And it's only by Christ's power that we can beat the enemy back. And we, in our churches, we spend so much time, spend, we spend so much time trying to beat up the enemy and beat up the devil when really all we need to do is lift God up and it will tear the devil down when we spend a lot of time trying to beat up the enemy we get tired and we get weak and we get weary we run out of breath we can't go anymore and eventually we're just falling down and we're giving up because it's not just it's not because nothing is happening it's because we're just looking at it the wrong way our eyes aren't on God anymore they're on ourselves we cannot beat the enemy by ourselves Christ has to be the head we have to keep our eyes on him 
and his authority and power, that's the only way the enemy will be beaten back. And I know that if I praise God, the enemy is cursed. He is beaten down. He is lowered. When I raise Jesus, the enemy is lowered. Whenever I praise God, the enemy is whatever the opposite of praise is. He's criticized. <laughs> okay? So whenever I feel like doubt's coming on, like the enemy's getting in my face, and he's starting to question the promises that I know God gave me, and the word that I believe, and, and remember that God specifically spoke to me to carry out. If he wanted me to stay here, or if he wanted me to go talk to that person out on the street, or if he wanted me to, to go pick somebody up and give them a ride somewhere, or give them some money, okay, whenever God specifically spoke that thing to me, and I feel doubt start, starting to come in, that's some opportunity for me to praise God. Because when I praise God, I'm given the authority that I need to be able to stand against the doubt that the enemy is trying to put into me. If you feel doubt, it's not because it's not right. If you feel doubt, it's not because God didn't speak to you. It's because the enemy is, and you're having a conversation with him. You're talking to the enemy. And you're not looking at God anymore. There is hope when you look at God. There is always hope and there will always be faith to keep going, to never fall back, to never quit, and to never give up. Because God does not end. When you are looking at the, th the most perfect thing there is, the thing that never ends and never ceases, the man that never sleeps, then you cannot fall back. You cannot give up. So if you start feeling doubt, then think about who you're looking at. If you start feeling doubt, is it because you're trying to do this the whole time by yourself? Is it because you've been having a conversation with the enemy for too long and you've forgotten to worship and praise God? You know, the majority of God's armies back in that day went into battle praising God. They didn't praise God after the victory was won. They went into battle praising God. Because in that they realized that in praising God, their enemy was defeated. And that's why the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. Because he praised God. He kept his eyes on God on his father. So whenever Adam and Eve hear the sound of God and they hide from him because the enemy has convinced them that they they should be doubting God's word, they should be doubting his heart. God walks through and he he calls out, "Where are you?" And they come out, they get up, and Adam gets up and he says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Guess what looking at yourself creates? Fear. Guess what depending on you creates? Fear. I'm afraid of me too. <laughs> I'm afraid of me without God. If you're afraid, maybe it's because you're hiding from God. And then God, this is my favorite part, first thing He says is, who told you you were naked? He's going, I didn't tell you that. And I'm the only one that can say anything like that. <laughs> I'm the only one who knows the truth. I'm the only one who can... <laughs> I'm the only one who can tell you that, okay? If somebody else is telling you that, then you got to let go of it, okay? Who told you you were naked? Because I didn't. And if I didn't, then it doesn't mean anything. Okay? If I didn't tell you you were naked, then it doesn't mean anything. Nothing at all. And I love that also because 
It's not just... Whenever he says, who told you you were naked, he was not paying so much attention to the mistake that they made as much as he was paying attention to what they believed they were. And God cares about that part of us. He cares more about what we believe we are and what we see ourselves as. He cares more about the fact that we might not be looking at ourselves through His eyes than He does if we make a mistake. Okay? He doesn't want us to make mistakes. He doesn't want us to fall and sin. But there's grace there to cover that. The part that He's more worried about is how we see ourselves. And it's in, the reason He's so worried about that is because He wants us to see us through Him. And if we see us through Him, we can never doubt Him in us. We can never doubt Him and His authority and His power in us if we are seeing us through Him. So I don't want to hide from the sound of God. I don't want to hide when I hear Him coming. If I hear Him coming, I want to be a part of Him coming. If I hear Him coming, I want to be a part of the advancement of His kingdom. That is the enemy's plan. Not to tear down God's kingdom, but to tear down you so you can't help it advance. Okay? He can't go after God directly, so He's going to go after those who are working for Him. (laughs) He's going to go after those who are serving Him. So whenever I hear the sound of God coming, just like the sound that the disciples heard in the book of Acts church before God's presence fell and tongues of fire appeared on their heads and and everything, all of Christianity was changed forever because God came. Before that was the sound that they heard. And I don't want to hide from that because I want to be there when God comes. I don't want to be afraid and start doubting what God has told me and the promises that I know that He's given me. Whenever He comes. Because those are the things that I'm going to use to beat back the enemy. It's those promises. It's the trust and the faith that I have in God. If His Word is to keep going, then we're going to keep going. If His Word is to stay here, then we're going to stay here. If His Word is to keep on pushing and keep fighting, then we're going to keep pushing and we're going to keep fighting. And if His Word is stop depending on yourself, And stop fighting the enemy and just start looking at me. Praise my name. Lift me up. And the enemy will be torn down. Then that's what I want to do. God gives us the ultimate weapon in Scripture when He says, Be still and know that I am God. That does not mean don't move. (laughs) That doesn't mean be passive. That literally translates to cease the striving. And it even translates further than that to say, enough! That's enough. Stop. Striving is something you do out of your own strength. And if you would just stop and know that I'm God and look at me, then you won't have to do that anymore. You're not going to get tired because I never sleep. (laughs) And if you're depending on the one that never sleeps, you won't have to either, (laughs) in a sense. (laughs) Go home and go to sleep tonight. But (laughs) So could you just stand with me for, and we're going to pray this out. God, we thank you for your word and your heart. And we trust, Lord, in your power and your authority right now. We place all dependence on you. And we choose to stop sitting down and lying down and whining about our circumstance and our situation and keeping our focus on those things rather than you. God, we choose to step away from doing that. We choose to step away from depending on a human, ourselves, to pull us through something. And we fix our eyes on you, God. And we recognize your power. And we recognize your authority.
And we stop striving and we stop fighting when we don't have to. We stop fighting against an enemy that can actually beat us. God, and we give ourselves to you. God, as our general, we give ourselves to you. And we ask that you be our general, God. We ask that you be our strength. We ask that you be our power. We ask that you be our authority. God, and in that, God, I ask that you would renew hope in this place and you would renew vision where vision has been lost and you would push us forward where we are not moving forward that you will pull us back whenever we're moving backwards and turn us around flip us back around to see what's important God as a body we commit to that right now in the name of Jesus we commit to seeing you and you alone And we believe right now that our part in warfare against the enemy is lifting up our God in praise, in worship. It's recognizing your victory. It's recognizing your power and your strength. It's recognizing your hope. It's recognizing your authority. As a body right now, I just want us to... I want us first of all to begin to pray. Just pray in the Spirit. Because I want this to be broken off once and for all. I want to walk in God's victory. I want to walk in God's power and His authority. And I don't want to hide from His sound. You know, we were given the word about the sound that was going to be released and the sound that was coming. And I don't want to hide from that. Because we were given the word that that sound was going to bring about a big change. It was going to turn things completely around. And I don't want to hide from that move. So just lift up your voices right now and pray in the Spirit. As one body, God, we stand with you tonight, God. We stand with you, God, and we agree with heaven right now, Lord. We agree, God, with the vision that you placed in this place, God. And we step back, God, and we recognize, God, that you still want something to happen in this place. You still want something to happen in Oklahoma. And we agree with that vision, God. We ask that you would renew right now, God, renew hope where hope has been deferred. God, we ask that you would renew faith where faith has been lost, God. The faith to move mountains through your power, God. God, and your strength. God, restore those things, God, and restore your character in this place. Restore your strength in this place. Restore your power in this place, God. And we go back to the vision that we once had to contend for revival in Oklahoma. We go back to the vision that we once had to see fire in the middle of Oklahoma, God. We go back to that vision and we don't step away from it, God, because now our eyes are fixed on you. And we praise you, God. We praise you, God, for what you've done. And we praise you, God, for who you are. God, we praise you for the, for setting your son on the throne, God, and taking all authority over all things, God. And we submit to you right now as part of your body and taking that authority in the name of Jesus. We take the authority that you've given us, God, under your name and under your praise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yes, Jesus. Oh, yeah.